Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you could join us. I had to send Matt Allen home sick because he was blowing chunks, and I didn't want anything to do with that. So I am Dave Riccio. This is Bumper to Bumper Radio, and I brought in Joel Bartko again because it was very familiar since he was here last week to give me a hand in Matt's place. And he was the most convenient guy that would come down within 15 minutes. So thanks, Joel, for being here. And we're looking for, forward to a great show. We are helping the motoring public have a better overall car experience. If you've got car questions, we've got car answers. So we encourage you to give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Brake fluid flushes, do you need them, is on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap. We're going to be taking your phone calls and anti-lock brake systems. Joel, you get people in your shop all the time. They've got a little yellow ABS light. They came in for some other problem, like an oil change, but that ABS light is something they don't even really think about. They think it's going to be expensive. Is that something you see? Yeah, all the time, Dave. A lot of time people just don't even want, they want to ignore it because they think it's going to be very expensive. They don't understand how it works, and they don't even want to know. Don't want to know. And ABS, people probably don't know it. It's been, it started in airplanes back in the 1930s. It was an electronic back at that time. They used a flywheel and valve system that I really have no idea how it worked, but it, it worked at that point. It's still been big in aircrafts. They use it there. In the automobile, Chrysler in the 70s with Bendix brakes started getting an ABS. And the thing with ABS is the steering, it is going to decrease your stopping distances on dry pavement. In some situations, it may increase your stopping distance, but it gives you the ability to steer. And, uh, you know, when ABS was first kind of coming around, you saw it in pickup trucks, usually in the rear of the truck, uh, as opposed to, you know, all four wheels, because if the rear tires lock up and in pickup trucks, they like to, there's no weight back there. Uh, that's when you lose the most control. And it is the scariest if you ever had the back wheels lock and not the front wheels. It's not a good situation. Those were some of the simpler systems in the old pickup trucks where they had one sensor in the back. They called it a dump valve. It would just release the pressure because the rear wheels would lock up. Nowadays, the systems are so much more complex with four-wheel ABS, traction control tied in, stability control all tied in. There's a very complicated system. Well, you as the consumer, what the heck is there when the guy calls you from, from the uh, shop and is telling you about your ABS system and what could be wrong with it? The way that anti-lock brakes work is that there is a wheel speed sensor at each wheel, and that's measuring the speed of the wheel, and when it sees, there, and then those sensors are connected to a control module, a little brain, and it, when it sees that one wheel is starting to you know, stop or going a lot slower than the other three, or maybe they're all starting to stop where it doesn't want them to stop, it backs the brakes off electrically because there's some solenoids in a, in a mechanical module where, so you push the brakes, the fluid leaves the master cylinder, hydraulic pressure goes into that unit where there's a couple of solenoid valves uh, that open and close. There's also a pump, Joel, stop me if I'm wrong because I think you know more about this than I do, uh, that builds up pressure and there's a pressure reservoir and that's going to apply and unapply brakes. Yeah, the, the pressure to each wheel is applied and controlled by the computer. Once your foot is on that brake pedal, if the computer sees one sensor spinning at 30 miles an hour, another one at zero, meaning it's locked up, it'll release pressure on one wheel and allow it to apply on the other wheel. With the newer systems now, those older systems just used an ABS control module. Now that ABS control module or a computer, as you want to call it, is tied into the engine control computer and the stability control computer. All of them need to talk to each other at the same time to know if your foot's on the gas, if you're turning right or left, which wheel to lock, are you hitting ice, which we don't see in Phoenix much, but everything's tied together. It's all done through, uh, they call them CAN communication lines. All those systems are all hand-in-hand hand now. Well, there's on, on a vehicle, there's... there's 15 modules, 20 modules anymore on these complicated vehicles, and they're all talking, and Joel mentioned, mentioned a canned network. That's a communication area network in the car, and all those things are constantly talking to each other. So that yellow light is on, says ABS. Uh, some of the components that could have an issue, one would be a wheel sensor. That is the most common reason you'll see that ABS light turn on, the most common. Uh, they're, they're usually integral to the hub bearing. So what happens if a bearing starts to go bad, that will usually cause the sensor to go bad. So that's the most common. What's the second most common, Joel? Well, the sensors are very common. The control modules are, are have been known to go out on the GM cars and a lot of the European cars. The relays for the system are built into the control module, and a lot of times you would need a control module. 
which just four or five years ago we had to get your new module. Nowadays we can take your module out, have it repaired, and reinstall it, save you a lot of money, and have your car back safe in the way it's supposed to be. So modules, modules are another big one. Uh, you know, when I was I was doing a little bit of reading before we came to this topic, and I, you know, there's a yaw sensor in most cars now. <laughs> Most late model cars, a yaw sensor, and that's going to compare the direction uh, which the vehicle is going, and it's going to compare that. It's going to reference that off of a steering sensor, and so it knows the the car, the brain in the car, the computer knows, hey, the car, the driver wants to go straight, yet the car is going sideways. And between those two, it can apply brakes to straighten the vehicle out. And that same yaw sensor is tied into the stability control and into the seatbelt system and into the airbag system because it's all used to see how quick the car's decelerating to know what's going on well and it really is as electronics have gotten cheaper there's just more and more and more systems showing up on cars these cars are a hundred times safer than they used to be you know people come in and they say you know dave you own an auto shop or transmission shop you got to get yourself a hobby car man i don't want a hobby car because the car i drive has got four-wheel disc brakes it's got traction control it's it's just a nice car and when you go back and you get in that car from the 60s man they don't they don't drive so good anymore. <laughs> well, I love the old cars from the 50s and the 60s and love them. And But, boy, if you're going to be in a collision or safety-wise, you're so much better in a newer late model car where you've got the airbags and the ABS system because that computer can think and take over a lot quicker than you can in a time of panic. Well, the computer is a lot more reactive than we are. In the old days, you would just, you know, if when you're using ABS anti-lock brakes, uh, in the old days we would, was it threshold braking? is what they call it. You would, you would brake but let off if it felt like it was locking up. Well, I, I was taught to pump the brakes in a skid, especially growing up back east in New York with snow and ice all the time. Now when you, my kids are taught to drive, they're told if you're in a skid condition, you hold your foot on the brake pedal, that car will take over, and it will take over with stability control and with braking, so you don't have to do it. And I think by now most people are familiar with that. If you're not, and even if you have teenage drivers, and we talked a lot about that last weekend, go find a parking lot, go lock up the brakes so you can just feel what that feels like when the pedal, the pedal's going to pulsate and you're going to hear this noise, and that's the pump and the solenoids and all those things working. So if you see the yellow light, it's worth getting it checked out. What happens when that yellow light is on is it has just disabled that system. It's saying, we see an error in the system. It's not functioning right, so we're just going to shut it off yeah, altogether. Your ABS would be overridden at that point. You would not have anti-lock braking. You would have conventional-style braking, but you would not have the ABS. You would not have your stability control working when that light's on. So it's something that really should be taken care of and maintained. It's not that bad. In my wife's car, she drives a Toyota Camry. Her ABS light came on, and it was a, it was a wheel sensor and the hub bearing was bad, and because of that, it all went bad. So Common failures are wheel sensors, and hub bearings cause that. Uh, we'll see sensors ripped out where the wires get ripped out, common thing. Uh, dirt and debris collect on the sensor. Sometimes I've had cars come in where we just had to clean out the fly ring, the ring that goes around because it couldn't see the spaces in it, and that was all it was. Well, you know, that's that brings up a point about Good repair work on your car, not good repair work on your car. You know, you go, you can go in and get a brake job from just anybody, but uh, there is workmanship. You know, a good technician is going to take the wheel sensor out. He's going to clean it. He's going to clean. They call it an exciter ring, is what the sensor actually reads on the inciter ring. It spins and it almost looks like a somewhat like a gear. It's got teeth all the way around it, and in the sensor really is a magnet, and it's it's catching up the pulse of the wheel. That's how it reads it. So someone can clean that and take care of that and just save you a trip to the auto shop and a little, little yellow light. Another thing I've seen is that I've seen where ABS sensors can cause transmission problems. People don't realize this, but I've had people come in, my transmission's not shifting right. That transmission reads its shift points on some of the vehicles off the wheel speed sensors, especially on BMWs a lot, we see that. That's a good point, and that comes to transmission diagnostic, my favorite topic, because I'm at Tri-City Transmission. But we often see vehicles where the transmission was replaced completely in air because people didn't know any better. And you said BMW, and that's the most classic, is that you'll get, when we scan the, uh, in a BMW, they call it an EGS, electronic gear, you know the name of it, Joel, but it scans the, uh, you know, the wheel sensors to know if the transmission is slipping or not, and you'll get a gear ratio error. At the end of the day, it's just a, it's just a speed sensor that's causing you to need a new transmission. So when we come back, we've got wide open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. 
Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio and Matt Allen. He left here sick. I actually sent him home because I didn't want him breathing on me. I didn't want what he had because it didn't look good. So I invited Joel Bartko with Arizona Import Specialist who was willing to come down in 15 minutes, which I really appreciate. Thank you, Joel. And uh, hey, a little bit of little bit of news. Last week we had Danny, one of the instructors from Bondurant, the Bondurant School of High Performance Driving, that was in with us, and they brought us a uh, gift certificate for a free team driving, which is a it's an over five hundred dollar value. So we had some uh, people shoot us some. They liked us on Facebook, which we really appreciate, uh, and and let us know. And we're throwing those names in a hat. And then also, if you go to bumper to bumper radio dot com. On the news link, there is an explanation of the course, and then there's a little uh, little place where you can register, and we'll put those names in a hat, and we're going to pick a winner of that. So bumper to bumper radiocom on the news link, and it's a great value. If you've got a teenager that uh, doesn't want to learn how to drive from you but is happy to learn how to drive from somebody else, this is a big deal. So bumper to bumper radiocom up first this segment, we're going to go with Daryl in Gilbert. Looks like he's driving a 2004 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Go ahead, Daryl. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, yeah, I've got a, a problem with my Cherokee, and I know one of the contributing factors probably is some loose motor mounts, but when I put the car or the Jeep into reverse, it, it uh, basically misses. And I'm getting a code and an engine light, and I've had the code checked. You know, obviously, yeah, you know, my brother-in-law has a code checker. What's the What's the <laughs> yeah, code? Uh, do, you, do you know the number and the definition of it? I, I don't know the number. I just remember that it was it's a misfire code on cylinder four. Okay. Uh, it's a six-cylinder inline. Yeah, four liter but straight it six. It only does it when I put it in reverse, and then once I go into drive, it drives fine the rest of the time. I don't think that. Being in reverse would affect a misfire code in any way. It, it may load it more. Um, my, my thinking was possibly it's it's um, maybe pinching a, a fuel line or or shorting out an electrical wire. Here's my sounds- here would be my thing, Daryl. Is that uh, I I worked for a Jeep tour company when I was going to school, and so I'm very 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 familiar with that motor. And uh, basically, my thinking is when the engine is running rough. It's got a misfire problem. Um, more than likely, that's coil over plug. We may have a coil issue or a plug issue. It could be an injector issue, but that needs to be diagnosed. But what happens is, you know, when the motor is in drive, the engine is torquing from left to right. So all the load goes on the right motor mount, and you stretch the left one. When you put it in reverse, it actually torques the other direction. So sometimes you'll feel misfires in reverse where you won't feel them in drive. What do you think about that, Joel? Well, you're, com- you're looking like you don't believe me. <laughs> I'm just thinking the computer's going to be picking this up, and I don't know if this is something you're looking to try to fix yourself or something you want to bring somewhere. Yeah, right, right. Well, I mean, I think if, if you're going to do some of your own, you know, backyard mechanicking, you know, the, the simplest thing to do is, is to go change stuff. So we got a misfire on cylinder number four. Why don't we go ahead and swap spark plugs from four to three and, th- you know, put threes and fours, and then when the coach shows back up, where did it move to? Or, you know, another common one. On that one, I don't believe that's one, that's one row of coils. So yeah. you actually can't swap those coils. But uh, I think that would be a good start. But as far as it being in reverse, making it worse, I don't think it's related. Uh, it just happens to be that the engine's in a different circumstance. So thanks for the call, Daryl. Let's go with looks like Gary in Phoenix on a 2003 BMW. It's perfect for you, Joel. Go ahead, Gary. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. You guys just described uh, prior to the first caller about four things that are happening to my car in the last three days. Um, uh, First of all, 132,000 miles on it. The clutch is starting to slip a little bit. Um, And I have to come down and talk to Dave about that. But um, more recently, my brake light came on and had the tires uh, rotated and noticed the front front brakes look like they do need to be replaced. But over the last 24 hours, um, and I, the brake light's been on for maybe a week, but I drive it fairly gingerly. And now the ABS, the brake light, that is the word break 
associated with what I consider. Is that your red brake light and the ABS light on, like if you had your parking brake on? Yeah, and the electronic stability control light. All three of them are showing up, and my speedometer's dead. (laughs) <laughs> I'm thinking right now you've got a, a wheel sensor problem of some sort by the speedometer being dead, but you would need somebody to scan that car and see what codes are going on. The red brake light, that's usually for low brake fluid. Is the brake lining light on? Yes, and, and that, I'm assuming that's That's because you probably I, need brake pads. Yeah, I need the brake pads at the front. But the speedometer and the ABS light, I would. what model is it? It's a 2003 5 Series with a little 5-speed, this little straight 6 with a 5-speed. You're going to need someone that could actually plug that car in to see the stability ABS system to see what's that reading and why that speedometer's out. Well, that's that's real good, Gary. Appreciate the call. We've got a couple of shops uh, at BumperToBumperRadio.com if you're looking for one. Joel's, of course, is in Tempe, and then Matt Allen at Virginia Auto Service. They do a ton of BMW or import work, so either one of those two are good places to start. But it sounds like we've got two issues, so we've got the brake lining and more than likely that brake light coming on with low fluid. That's pretty common because as the pistons are pushed out further in the system, low fluid shows up. That particular model he has is very prone to the module. They have a thing they call an ABS repair kit through BMW. Most common thing for the speedometer and the ABS light going, but you'd still need to have somebody diagnose it. Thanks for the call, Gary. We are going to go with George in Mesa on a 1996 Dodge 250 van. Go ahead, George. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, thank you. Um, I got a pretty good coolant leak which I thought was coming out of the uh, water pump, but is actually coming out of right behind the uh, timing chain cover. One of the bolts, or two of the bolts, actually. What motor's in there? It's a 318 motor. Very common issue. You'd have to re- pull, pull the timing cover. The gaskets usually have to be replaced. A lot of time, those timing covers are eroded by corrosion, so you'd have to have somebody take it apart. Check the cover. If the cover's good, you would just need new gaskets. Very common on the 318s. 318s. So that's a, that motor's been around, around forever. forever. So nothing new. Shouldn't be too difficult. So thanks for the call, George. Uh, we're going to sneak one in here before the break. Looks like Alan in Phoenix on a 2005 F-250. Go ahead quickly. Yeah, I have an auto- automatic transmission with a diesel. And uh, it's up to... The gauge goes to operating temperature normal, and all of a sudden it drops off. Tow haul light comes on, says check gauges on the dash. Everything works fine. I'm wondering if it's just a temperature sensor. Yeah, I I believe on that, you know, that's a 5R110 is the transmission that's in there, and I I believe the temperature sensor is part of the solenoid pack uh, that's in there. So... What I'd be looking for, do we really have a transmission that's overheating? Chances are, you know, we don't uh, if, if it's working good. Uh, but we need to compare the actual temperature of that thing. And if it's intermittent, you know, we could have a sensor, we could have a wire, we could have a computer issue. So, you know, ideally, if it's a sensor, that's going to be the easiest thing. You know, and hopefully it's not some sort of loose wire issue that we've got to spend a lot of time tracking down. So appreciate the call if you need to get a hold of a good transmission shop bumper to bumper radio.com of course tri-city transmissions on there but there's a lot of other great shops that could handle it as well it looks like you're in phoenix so i think of kurt's auto repair up there on i-17 in bell so when we come back we've got open lines at 602-277-5827 you're listening to bumper to bumper radio well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and Matt Allen was sent home sick, so we've got Joel Bartko from Arizona Import Specialist who came in to help me help you with your car. All you've got to do to get involved with the show is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. We've got Tom, Mike, Daryl, Stephen, and Andrew on the line. We are going to go with Tom in Mesa. It looks like he's got a 2005 Nissan Xterra. Go ahead, Tom. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. I thank you for taking my call. You bet. I'm actually calling about a friend, or for a friend who lives in Prescott. Uh, he took his car in, um, is having transmission problems. I'm not sure what they are, but he got a quote from the shop uh, to replace the radiator and rebuild the transmission because of a design flaw that Nissan had 
where the transmission leaks uh, fluid into the coolant? Yeah, that's uh, pretty common. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. So don't worry, the shop is not full of full of hot air. We're seeing this more and more, and the X-Terra is one of them. Mid-2000 ranges. The Frontiers also. Same. Frontiers, X-Terra is really common. And what happens is inside the radiator, it's, it's two parts. The radiator cools the engine with engine coolant, and then it also cools and warms the transmission. There's a compartment basically in the bottom of the side of the radiator that does that. You cannot share engine coolant with transmission fluid. It's not good at all. So what's happening, and this is actually, there's a couple of fenders, and Nissan is one of them, but the other one is the Volvo. Volvo. Volvo's a regular problem for this. So shop's not full of crud, and it's a very expensive fix. So I've heard of people spending $5,000 because you have to, it's a, the transmission's an RE5R01A, and it's got a computer on the inside of it. So that's a $1,000 piece right off the bat to rebuild or remanufacture that And, and it's good that they knew that the radiator was bad, that they didn't put a transmission in and then find out through your next transmission that your radiator's bad. If you have one of these cars, an uh, Xterra or a Volvo, I've actually changed my tune on this deal. I don't tell people to, because it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to happen. So you got a Volvo, you can take it into a shop. If they've got a glycol test, they can test the transmission fluid to make sure that's not happening. And as long as that's not happening, go ahead and just bypass the radiator and install an air cooler. It gets rid of all the possibility of that happening, because it does definitely happen. You may get a replacement radiator, and it, it could have the same problem. So good call, Tom, and uh, tell your friend, yeah, it's unfortunate it happened, but uh, you can't, once engine coolant has got into the transmission, no matter how much you flush it out, they're going to die because what happens is it delaminates the clutches uh, because of the, you know, the, the flash fire that goes on inside there, so it boils them. We are going to go with, looks like, Daryl in Gilbert on a 2010 uh, Toyota RAV4. Go ahead, Daryl. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, yes, I took my car into the uh, dealership, and they told me I need uh, new front brakes and a uh, wheel alignment. And I thought their prices were kind of high to do this. And I was wondering, do you have anybody that does this kind of stuff? We got all kinds of people that do that kind of stuff. How many miles are on your 2000? 35,000. 35,000 miles. And did they tell you the brakes were worn down to a certain percentage? Uh, no, it just said the, uh, well, on the uh, thing I have here, it says the uh, alignment is off, and it says front brakes, inner pads, and it says 3 mm. 3 well, millimeters. Yeah, that's a 3 millimeter measurement. That's about the time they would need replacement. Anything under 3 is considered time to do it. You want to do it before you need new rotors. Hopefully your rotors are still thick enough to resurface, and they would do a complete brake job. Check the system out. Sounds normal with the mileage you have and everything. It is pretty normal. And, you know, I hear that three millimeter measurement. I hear that thrown out there a lot. And I don't know if they're talking about three millimeters from the squeaker. I don't know if they're talking about a combination of we got one and a half on the inner pad. It's and been one a half. personal thing of mine for the last two, three years. For years, we always had the technicians come up to us, including me, and say it's got 10% left, 20% left. And I always say 10% left a watt. Nowadays, we all have these measuring sticks that we actually measure the brake pad the thickness of the pad from the metal base to the pad. A lot of new pads start out 9 or 10 millimeters. Once they're down to about 3, you want to replace them because you'll, you'll get vibrations, squeaking, and noise. But we don't leave it up to percentages anymore. We usually measure the pads. That's the way it's done now. Hey, Daryl, back to your, your original question is, hey, you know, I wasn't crazy about the price, and you guys have a different shop that you would recommend, and we, we've got all kinds of shops. Out in Gilbert, a good dealership alternative is Desert Car Care. They actually have three locations out the direction. They're completely capable of doing brakes on a, a Toyota RAV4, as, as far as they're concerned. That's just vanilla. Not a big deal. As far as the price goes, you know, me as a shop owner, I can call my parts supplier, and I can buy a set of brake pads for a for one particular car that costs ten dollars, or I can buy for that same car, that same you know same position on the car, so fronts and in the parts place wants eighty dollars. I go through that every day, Dave. When we look on our screen to buy the parts, I'll see pads from as cheap as ten dollars to up to a hundred dollars. I personally prefer original equipment style pads made by the original manufacturer. I don't think you need most people's applications to go better than that, and I don't like to go call cheaper because you usually get what you pay for. Well, you start to get into squeaks and you start tearing up rotors because maybe they're super yeah. hard. There's or... ceramic brakes now. There's semi-metallic brakes now. There's so many choices. I usually like to use what the manufacturer used. That's my personal opinion. 
So any any shops there, uh, Daryl, at bumper to bumper radio.com, you'll see a map of the valley. You can put in your zip code. You can, if you want a personal referral, I would be more than happy to connect you with somebody from Desert Car Care. Uh, no, Frank and his guys very well up there. So thanks for the call. We are going to go with Andrew in, oh, actually, sorry, Mike in uh, Apache Junction. He's got uh, a question on ABS systems. So go ahead, Mike. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Yeah, yeah, my name's Mike. I, I'm a mechanic, been an a ASC certified mechanic for almost 40 years. Um, one of your comments you made on the ABS was, was about hub bearings, and that's something I always tell my customers. When, when ABS lights on, if it's because of the sensor, it's very, very possible it's a bad hub bearing. And if you keep driving on that, you're going to have more issues and you're going to have uh, drivability issues if the hub bearing gets loose. So, so it, it's extremely important to have those ABS systems checked out. We, we do it all the time. I, uh, and uh, and it's, it's, the hub bearing is, is probably the most common, the sensor and the hub bearings that we replace on a, on a regular basis. Um, other thing I want to mention real quick, Dave, uh, I heard you say uh, a couple of weeks ago about working at a Chevron station that's no longer open at Indian School in Miller. I worked at the same place in the 70s. Someday <laughs> we're going to have to talk about Al White Chevron. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, definitely appreciate the call, Mike. And uh, you, know, you heard from him, you heard from Joel, heard from me. Hub bearings are the most common. And one thing that people don't notice about hub bearings going bad, and my wife had no idea in her Toyota Camry that the hub bearing was bad. I mean, I get in the car and I'm driving. I'm going, oh my goodness, how can you drive with that noise going on? And it's just, a, it's a curse when you fix cars. You know, you, you know, you, that's the first thing you do is you find something wrong with the car. But hub bearings generally make noise. And the way we, we check them and know which one it is, is that when you swerve the car. So you could be going 45 miles an hour. You can hear that thing. It kind of looks, sounds like a prop on a plane. <laughs> A lot of the speed sensors now are sold with the hub bearings as an assembly. A lot of the hub bearings come complete with the sensor and everything. The whole deal. So the ABS light may be turning you on to some other problem you didn't even know you had, like a hub bearing going bad. And I've seen hub bearings go bad to where these people are lucky the wheel did not fall off the car. So thanks so much for the call, Mike. We've got a couple of open lines. at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And we got an email this week was from, uh, looks like, from Stan in Chandler. He's got a Subaru. He was in at the dealership, get some regular maintenance, and they offered him a brake fluid flush. He wrote uh, for $120. He wasn't interested, so he said no. And then they offered him a cheaper alternative of a brake fluid change. And so he said no to that as well. He emailed us and said, you know, brake fluid flush, brake fluid change. Do I need it? What is it? Are they just trying to take my money? So uh, I, I thought ABS, very perfect topic. And uh, definitely brake fluid, brake fluid flushes are a good idea, but there's some objectivity to when and how they should be done. So the brake fluid change is different than a brake fluid flush. So, Joel, why don't you describe how a brake fluid flush works? Well, a a brake fluid flush done properly is where they hook a a machine, a pressure bleeder with an adapter onto the top of your master cylinder. They usually suck the old fluid out of there first, put new fluid in the machine, contains an all-new DOT4 brake fluid. You want to use the right brake fluid. DOT4 pretty much fits 98% of the cars on the road today that we use. The difference DOT3 to DOT4, mostly about temperature. Um, but you want to flush the brake system because you're protecting the master cylinder, the ABS pump, the modules. You're protecting the calibers, the lines. You're getting all that old junk out of there. You want new, clean fluid. Brake fluid collects moisture. When you're driving, when it gets hot, the fluid starts to boil up, gets moisture. Copper buildup ruins your calibers, ruins your master cylinder. Years ago, they didn't push it. All you had was a master cylinder and some wheel cylinders. They were cheap. Wasn't wasn't a, wasn't a big deal back then, but now it's an expensive system. And I said there's some uh, objectivity to it. So there's a test that you can do on the brake fluid to to know when it needs that. Yeah, they have little sticks that you put in there that measure the moisture and the copper content of the brake fluid. Um, a lot of European cars that we work on have right on the dashboard. They have lights that light up, tell you it's time for a brake flush, time for spark plugs. I like to recommend brake fluid flush almost every two years on most of the vehicles I work on. I just find that the fluid starts to get mucky. Runes, calibers, you'll see, you'll see brake fluid pumps go out quicker. This is preventative maintenance. It doesn't fix anything. It's 
totally preventative maintenance on a very expensive system. So in this case, they may have done that. They may have tested the, the fluid, and they may have seen that, hey, it was due. It had a lot of moisture content. The boiling point of the fluid was, was, was way down, so it was boiling. Its effectiveness was way down. Now, what's this break fluid yeah, that's the one thing I was That gonna... feels a little bit unfuzzy to me, unfuzzy I mean, that's warm. just ridiculous. That's, you know, that's changing the least important part. That's just the part that's kept in the reservoir. That's probably the cleanest fluid there is in it anyway at that point. There's, if you're gonna, if you're not gonna flush it, I don't even see a reason to do that. It really doesn't justify anything. And if you have no idea what we're talking about, what the heck is a master cylinder? So you can picture it in your mind. You're pushing a brake brake pedal down below the steering wheel. That brake pedal is connected to a rod that runs out to the engine compartment, and that rod goes to a master cylinder. So in simplest forms, there's a plunger in there, and it forces fluid through four different lines to the four different wheels. So that's what that is. And the brake fluid change, that's basically just taking like like a turkey baster, sucking the fluid <laughs> out of the reservoir, and just pouring in some new fluid. Pretty ineffective. I would, if you're going to do it, it's definitely worthwhile to do a complete flush. And, and as a rule of thumb, every couple of years is not a bad way to do it. You certainly can save money on maintenance on your car and breakdowns by doing regular maintenance. So when we come back, we've got a couple open lines at 602 Two seven seven five eight two seven. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and uh, we are short Matt Allen today. He went home sick. He came down here just long enough to hopefully not contaminate me. So uh, in a pinch, I called Joel Bartko from Arizona Imports, and uh, he was loyal and zipped right down. So thank you, Joel, for coming down. We were talking during the break because we're talking about brake fluid flushes. And there's some people out there that get all excited about, you know, being a customer advocate and shops are just out to take your money and all that stuff. And there is some shops out there to take your money. But it doesn't mean there isn't some people that are recommending you good maintenance. And some flushes are good. And Joel mentioned just here recently he had a Toyota 4 Yeah, Joel. we had a 4Runner that needed a master cylinder. The pedal would just sink. That part alone was sixteen to seventeen hundred dollars for that particular model car. Not it, available aftermarket. No other choice. This is in the old days where you run down to uh, Acme Auto Parts and you pick up a thirty-five dollar rebuilt master cylinder. And then the other point he made was that hey, since we started doing brake fluid flushes, we've actually become believers in it because even when we started recommending, you know, we feel bad asking customers for money. We don't want to take their money. We want to do what's best for them. And, uh, you know, people were saying, this is a good idea, good idea, good idea. In the componentry, it, the failure of it's gone way down. So it is saving people money by keeping up on that. And then also the effectiveness of your brakes. Just having good brake fluid in there keeps it from boiling. So up for this segment, we are going to go with, it looks like, uh, Andrew in Phoenix on a 2008 uh, Chevrolet Malibu. Go ahead, Andrew. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the call. You bet. Hey, um, I had a random uh, question here. About a year ago, uh, I've been driving with it since then. My um, two things happened at once. My my check engine light came on, and my fuel gauge just stopped working. And uh, I, I, I I took it in, and what they ended up telling me was that uh, they were going to have to to drop the tank, is what they said, and replace the sensor and altogether it was looking around uh, a couple grand and I, I wanted to just see if, if that was normal or, or or what you guys thought about what that. I'm assuming you got there is a code for the fuel level sensor that would turn on the check engine light the computer wants to know how much fuels in that tank so it can perform a evaporative emissions test while you're driving as far as the price at a noble what I'm assuming is they're going to recommend to you a new fuel pump assembly with the fuel level sensor all attached to it um That'd be probably the proper way to fix it because if your your fuel pump's probably old at this point, and why do two repairs later on? So you're better off doing the whole thing at once, or it may not be available separate. Now he said a couple of grand. That that stands a little, you know, it catches a little. We don't talk a whole bunch about price here because we don't know the ins and outs and what kind of part and what qualified technician is working on all that stuff. But I'm thinking somewhere, you know. Eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars, somewhere in that range. I was thinking six to eight, and that's six why. To it's, eight. But it may, there are certain models out there where you have to buy a tank. I don't think that car is one of them. I'm, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, but I think that sounded high. But I'm not sure what you're getting, Andrew. We don't know the specifics of it. So as far as the price goes, it could 
completely be relevant. So I don't want to say it's not relevant. You know, there may be something I don't know about here or aware of, but I, I know they typically fall in that, in that kind of range or even what Joel mentioned. So, and for you to know what the fuel lever level uh, sensor looks like, just open up the back of your toilet. Toilet. You'll see that lever, you know, the float ball. You know, in the old days, they had a float ball and a lever. That's really what's on the side of the fuel pump mechanism. And it literally is a float, and then it, it runs up against a, a little electronic deal, and it lets, it lets the computer know how much fuel is in the tank. Because these cars are self-testing, they have to know how much fuel is in the tank when they pressurize the tank and test it so they know that it's airtight. So thanks so much for the call. We are going to go with Oscar in Buckeye. Looks like he's got a 2002 Acura. Go ahead, Oscar. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Taking my call. Go ahead. Um, I have the, uh, like I said, 2002 Acura Type L, uh, TL Type Sport, and um, I just got the rack and pinion and the uh, power steering pump replaced on it. Then I had the brakes done um, all within about a matter of a week. And now when I hit about 70 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour, I just have a, a rattling within the actual engine. Um, I don't know if it's something to do with the rack and pinion that was just replaced. Um, yeah, have you guys come up with that particular I- issue? Well, is it? Uh, do you feel anything in the steering wheel? Is the steering wheel nice and smooth, or is it wiggling a little bit? It's actually wiggling a little bit. Wiggling a little bit. When you say rattling, do you mean a rattle noise or a vibration like rattle? It's act- uh, more like a vibration, I would say. I mean, you can hear a humming definitely when I hit 70, 75 miles an hour. Does it go away at higher speed? Um, I haven't really tried it. Because I'm wondering if it's just a tire balance issue, or does it affect when you brake? Does it change or anything like that? Um, no. No. It is, I mean, it's basically once I hit 70, 75, that's the only time that I get to feel that. Um, I have hit 80 trying to see if it goes away, but it just the humming noise just becomes a little louder. Okay. I, you know, I'm not really sure. It's hard to, it's hard to describe a noise over the phone, and some people say a rattling, you know, and a buzzing and all that stuff. So that's one thing that we, you know, but there was a lot of work done here recently, a rack and pinion, brake job, to have some sort of noise going on. Immediately I went for the steering wheel. Is it moving? Because I think of a tire being a little bit out of balance, uh, causing a vibration, and, and that's what comes in my first I've thing. even seen noises being caused by after a power steering repair by the hose just maybe touching the firewall, not being locked in a clip in the right way and causing that to transmit into the vehicle. And it may not be a big deal. You know, we, we work on these cars. We'll do a, a transmission repair, uh, and the customer comes back a week later and says, there's just a, there's a weird noise. Come hear it. Well, I, I'm not even out of the parking lot. I can tell what the noise is. It, a lot of times it's a little heat shield, uh, you know, got moved, and there's just little thin pieces of metal that are, that are rattling under circum- cer- certain circumstances cause an issue we're going to sneak in one more we're going to go with uh looks like noel in apache junction on a 2007 ram diesel go ahead noel you're on bumper to bumper radio yeah i got a 2007 dodge ram 2500 5.9 diesel i only have about 50,000 miles on it and my truck doesn't get driven much sometimes three to five days it'll sit when i go to drive the truck i will put it in drive and the truck won't even roll, and sometimes I have to give it excessive gas to get the truck to roll. And a friend of mine recommended I put the truck in neutral and let it warm up for a few seconds before I attempt to drive it, and it will take off, and, and it does. That, that actually takes care of the problem. Yeah, I know uh, I'm, I wasn't sure in 2007 if they were still using that 48 RE. That's a transmission model number in there. That's been a lifelong Dodge thing. A lot of your rear-wheel drive Dodge transmissions, when they sit over any length of time, what happens is a, there's a bleed back, and there's transmission fluid, which is up in your uh, transmission cooler, which we talked about earlier, uh, which is a portion of the radiator, and a lot of them have an auxiliary cooler as well as that. And then there's a whole bunch of fluid in the torque converter. And when the car sits for three days, four days, what happens is all that fluid actually runs back out of the torque converter into the transmission or the, the, the main reservoir. And the same thing with the cooler runs all the way back into the transmission. So the level in the transmission, if you were to pull out the dipstick with the car not running after the car has been sitting, you would see that fluid level way up on the dipstick. So when you start the car, you know, we got to realize that the transmission really has to prime itself again. It's got to fill that torque converter up. So by putting it in neutral, that's maximum flow in the 48RE. So you can do that. It gets the transmission all primed up, put it in drive, and you're good to go. But 
fundamentally, there's nothing wrong there. So thanks for the call, Noel. We appreciate you sharing your Saturday with us. Remember, if you go to BumperToBumperRadio.com, on the news link, there's a giveaway of a teen driving course at the Bondurant High Performance School of Driving. And while you're at BumperToBumperRadio.com, go ahead and click on the Facebook link, like us on Facebook. Thank you, Peter, for putting on a great show. Joel, thanks for bombing down here to help me help our listeners with the cars. And uh, remember to find a relationship with a good shop, BumperToBumperRadio.com. You can email Matt and myself and the contact link. We'll see you next week.